Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to AI Scouted, recording on Christmas Eve, because that is how much we as a collective care about you, the listeners. Unlike other podcasters, no, mentioning no names like Gag Standen, we care about you, the listeners. I'm Dave Hendrick, joined as always by Mr. Carol Matchett. How are you, sir? Well, I'm going to continue the theme of caring for the listeners, and I feel very bad for having complained about minus four and minus three and all those kinds of temperatures last week, since some of our American and Canadian friends are now dealing with minus 20 this week. Yes, yes. The Canadians should be used to it. The the Americans in the north of America should be used to it. But the people who live in, like, Georgia and Tennessee and Texas, these people have never owned a coat before. And they've all had to rush out and buy coats because some Canadian weather got drunk and wandered its way south and is now just hanging out, causing problems. Um, Hope everybody is keeping safe. Hope everybody who has land and animals is keeping safe, has all they need, and is keeping their animals in nice and warm. It must must be strange to live in a place like, say, Dallas, Texas, uh, where a friend of mine is at the minute, and walk outside and expect sunshine and be greeted with snow. If you walked out of... The Spanish villa you're currently in and saw snow, Carol Matchett, how would you respond? Um, with with some surprise, more than likely, yeah. Especially since I can actually, you know, move about an inch to my left and uh, be, be sunburnt at the moment where it's coming through the glass. So, yes, that would be quite the surprise. Well, I could go outside and it would rain on me and uh, mm. that, would, that would be our weather. Yeah, for the no next surprise whatsoever. No, no surprise whatsoever to get rained on in Ireland. Uh, Guy Drinkle is with us behind the scenes but can't speak because it's too cold where he is and everything is frozen. Uh, Iceland is not the place to be for Christmas. Right, Carol, today we are going to pick five teams who we think should be active in the January transfer market. Five teams to watch. We'll do four from the Premier League, and at your suggestion, we'll do one from another European league, a team that needs to go and make... It could be a big signing. It could be a complimentary player to boost their chances of achieving their their goals for this season. So in the Christmas spirit, let's have your first one. Well, in the Christmas spirit, let's get things off to a nice positive start. Um, Liverpool. (laughs) I can't imagine why they'd be on this list. But of course, they are also on my list. So, yeah, well, let's go there. Yeah. Um, One is a minimum. Two would be, I think, probably close to ideal. You could make a case for more than that if you wanted. But realistically speaking, mid-season, all that kind of thing. I think Liverpool need two. Um, I think it's obviously painfully evident that we've needed one in midfield, but I think pure numbers and the fact that now Firmino is out injured for another few games as well, and the fact that we've not really had that consistency of availability up front, rather other than Mo Salah, of course, um, does now point to the fact that we probably need to look at another forward as well. Um, I've been over this a little bit um, on our previous podcasts, and suggested that maybe the short-term option here in the attack in three is a possibility, but not in midfield. That one has to be a permanent one, has to be a very good one, and has to be someone that we already were considering making a move for either last summer or the coming summer. Yeah, I would argue that over the next two windows, Liverpool probably need to buy five players, and I don't mean you know, a couple of Harvey Elliott's, a couple of Fabio Carvalho's and a Calvin Ramsey. They need to buy five grown-ups. 
uh, three in midfield over the next two windows because they're losing three. They're already short two as things stand. They need one for each role. They need a starter in the right-sided role. They need somebody that can share the left-sided role with Thiago, maybe play, if there's 60 games in a season, maybe that new player plays 35 and Thiago plays 25. And they need cover, proper, real cover for Fabinho. Someone that can play 20 to 25 games in that role can be called on if Fab is out to come in and give you a solid 7 out of 10 every single game, be strong defensively, and allow the team to function in the same way. Now, I know people will say, oh, well, Henderson can play there. No, he can't. The issue with Henderson is that when he plays there, he changes the dynamic of the team completely because he wants to be on the ball more than Fab does, and he's not nearly as good defensively. So I would say they need three in midfield, one in attack, because by sheer numbers and with the possibility that Bobby leaves, and to be truthful, even if Bobby stays... Mo, Darwin, Diaz, Jota, Bobby, I, I would want one more. I would want six in attack. And I think they need to invest in a centre-back in the summer as well. Not a starter, but a reliable backup player who long-term potentially could become a starter. Because with Joel Matip's age and Joe Gomez's injury issues and decline and the potential that he could go in the summer... I think that's a position that needs to be invested in as well. So if you need five across two windows, I think you're right. I think you've got to go and get two in the January. Now, you could potentially, like you said, go the short-term route in January and maybe get a loan option in. But I'd be really targeting that group of players who are out of contract in the summer. I'd be looking to maybe do a pre-contract and then try and lowball the club that has them at the moment. So... One name that's been around is Yusufa Makoko of Borussia Dortmund. Now, he is very young, but he is physically more than ready for men's football and has proven that. But the other option, and I think this would be maybe even a better option in terms of being able to make an impact straight away, is Marcus Turam. I think he would fit very well in Liverpool's group of forwards, can play left through the middle, And could do a job on the right if you needed him to. He's a good age. I think he's 25. With definite room for growth. uh, Room for development. He is indeed 25. Turned in August. Uh, This season, he's having arguably the best season of his career. Certainly in terms of goals, he's got 13 and 17. His career best is 14 in 39. So well on course to smash that record. He's been one of a few bright spots in a Gladbach team that haven't been haven't been very consistent. Uh, they currently sit eighth in the league, six wins, four draws, five defeats, and they've got a few players that probably are leaving in the summer. He will be one. I think Manu Kone is another, and he might be someone that we look at in midfield as maybe that that player who long term is the backup to Fabinho, but in the short term could alternate and play the left-sided eight role as well. So Marcus Turam would be one I'd put forward in in attack. In midfield, like the two, Jude is not available in January. So the other two ideals are Enzo Fernandez and Moises Caicedo. Now, there's a large price gap between those two players, but both of them fit very well into how we play. Enzo is the ideal player to split that left-sided role with Thiago and then take that role moving forward. Moises Caicedo can play the left-sided role. He can play the six. And long-term, I think he would be the six. So that's where I'd be looking. But do you have any names in mind otherwise? Are you that person who has everything? The coolest merch? And those must-have fan threads. Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA 
to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to AnfieldIndex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. Um, nothing outrageous, to be honest. My my one wish is that whoever does come in in midfield is obviously they have to be of the you know the level of quality on the ball and stuff that goes without saying, but is someone who can really add some physicality as well, some real energy, some real power, aggression in midfield because I think we've lacked that since basically since that other midfield broke up. You know, Ginny leaving, he was an understated but very physical player, very very difficult to bypass really good in the air, really tough to knock off the ball. I, very, very energetic, obviously. And like someone like Harvey Elliott obviously is energetic and that he's young and he's he, he moves quickly and a lot, but not always in the ways that you want it and probably not as defensively um, aggressive and, and difficult to bypass as we have been previously. Henderson, obviously, simply by advancing years, if nothing else, is on a physical decline as well. So I do think that we've lacked a bit of on and off the ball power. And I think that that's a key thing to be adding in midfield. Yeah, there are cheap options. There, There is the likes of Manu Kone, who'd probably cost somewhere in the 35 to 40 million range. Mm. Manuel Ugarte at Sporting, uh, primarily a six, but can, if needed, play as an eight, could play in that left-sided role and be more defensive next to Fabinho. Yunus Musa, potentially an option. Brings a lot of physicality. Now, he does have some technical limitations, but he's a great ball carrier. And if you were looking for a Ginny replacement to mould into Ginny 2.0, he could be an option. So there's definitely ways and means for us to do this. I mean, I know a lot of the focus is on Enzo and Jude. I I really do have a tough time seeing us get both of them. Yeah. I could see us getting one, and if we were to get one, I would prefer Enzo. I think he's the better player. Now, Jude is a couple of years younger, obviously, but I think Enzo... If you put Enzo in midfield, and even put him as the six, but put two really powerful physical eights either side, say Manu Kone and Yunus Musa, I think that midfield could function very, very well. And if you think back to... The pre-Fabinho midfield, when Henderson was the six, he wasn't great defensively there. Enzo's a better defensive player, and he's better on the ball. And if, say, Kone comes in to do what Emery Chan and players like that did on one side, and James Milner did on one side, and Musa comes in to do what Ginny did on the other side, you could rejig that original Klopp midfield. I mean, originally, I think he liked, he wanted it to be Ox. Henderson and Ginny with Emery as kind of the fourth midfielder who could play everywhere. And you'd get that kind of makeup in a in a Kone Enzo Musa midfield with Fabinho and Thiago still there to play quite a bit and Henderson there to play and Curtis Jones to play. And you know, you, you could do it that way as well, which would be a, a, a more cost effective way, but would obviously lead to tantrums when we didn't get Jude. It was. Um, and like you say, it's not just about that there are low cost options. There are other maybe shorter term ones as well. Um, if that's something that we, we feel in the end that we need to look at, like if we absolutely want Enzo and it has to be Enzo and he's given us a yes effectively, but it's not going to be done till summer. Find ways to get around it. I mean, look at, I don't know, loads of players who joined clubs in the summer and it hasn't worked out for them. Half season loans are available for other players. Frank Kessie, for example, who we mentioned as a potential one. There's, yeah. your, there's your running off the ball. There's your box to box ability and ball winning and everything else. Not in the Barca team. Wants a move. They want him gone. Half a season for someone like him is available. You can do that. You add what you need to and you don't have the commitment whereby they have to be in the side, for example, all the time. Or, you know, if, if, Navigator happens to go on a 15 match fitness streak. He can play, and Kessie is there in the wings waiting. And, you know, these things are available. There are solutions. That's always. the thing. You can get Kessie on loan with an option to buy. And say, say he comes in and does brilliantly, and you've secured a low buy option on him. Well, then you buy him. Even if you don't want to keep him long term, you can flip him in 12 months. He'll only be 27. And you could you could make a profit on him if you have him 
but Frank Kessie would be a great squad option at the very worst. Mm-hmm. He, but but right now he would come in and start for this team and add much needed physicality and power to what's a fairly weak midfield at the moment. I mean, Thiago's incredible. And he really does put himself about defensively, but he does have physical limitations. Fabinho is not short on aggression and toughness, but he, again, has physical limitations. And Henderson's physical decline because of injuries and age. Harvey Elliott has huge physical limitations because he's 5'7 and he's quite thin and he just doesn't have the required strength to play in midfield in the Premier League. For a team like us, he could play maybe in City's midfield in a couple of years, you know, in that kind of Bernardo-type role. But again, he he doesn't have Bernardo's burst of pace. So you, if you're going to play a, a player who's kind of that small, they need to be either lightning quick or really good defensively or something along those lines, like a Mascherano type, but he's not any of those things. Yeah, Frank Kessley would definitely interest me in January. If if we knew we... Let's say we knew we could get Enzo and Jude. Let's say we knew that was something that was going to happen. Well, Frank Kessley as a, a stopgap wouldn't be bad. Wouldn't be bad at all. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, someone like Turan that you mentioned, there are others who are similarly out of contract in the in the summer mm. in the forward line. So there are plenty of deals to be done, whether that's a short term one where whether it's an 18 month contract on a low initial bid or you just sign someone who you do want for the longer term, but you just pay a bit of money now instead of getting uh, a free transfer later on. There are definitely plenty of solutions. Definitely. Right. My first one is West Ham United who I think are probably the most disappointing team in the league this season. Now, I know they've had some injuries, but they spent they spent a large amount of money in the summer to massively upgrade the talent in their squad. Part of the problem is that Moyes is still too loyal to certain players, like Fabianski, for one. You've got a significantly better goalkeeper on the bench. Why is this man still in your team? He's been... Too loyal at left back. I'm not in, I don't love Emerson Palmieri. I think he's a fairly average player, but Aaron Cresswell is a couple of years past his best. Craig Dawson is a couple of years past his best, and he was never a tremendous player anyway. So Moyes holding players out to play those players has been an issue. But I think the biggest issue is in central midfield for them because Thomas Suchek was hugely overplayed for a couple of years, and now he can't run anymore. And Declan Rice has been asked to do an awful lot in midfield. And I think Rice has had a a bit of a poor season overall. I know he likes to talk up his own form and talk about moves elsewhere. But you're the club captain and your team is 16th in the league. So you're largely responsible for what goes on on the pitch. And you're not doing your role as a captain. But a part of it is the inability of the guy next to him to perform his role I think West Ham need to be looking for a dynamic midfielder who's also got a high level of ball winning and defensive screening to sit in next to Rice. Let Rice play a bit further forward because defensively he's questionable as well. But, you know, if you had the two of them to split the workload in there with, say, Lucas Paqueta as your third midfielder, I think you'd start to see a more dynamic team, a, a more functioning team. And when players like Agard and Zuma come back, that will solidify the defence. You've got Ben Johnson emerging as your right back. You can address left back in the summer. You've got good options on the wing. Bowen's had a bad season, but there's a player there. Max Cornet's a good player. Fornals is a good player. Ben Ram is a good player. And you've got a really good striker in Gian- and Gianluca Scamacca. But you've got to start finding service for him as well. But I think if you could give the attack a better platform to play off by putting a midfielder in next to Rice, who's not basically a tree, I think it would work a lot better. It's almost as though they could have done with last year playing someone like Alex Kral. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. And for whatever reason, Moyes refused to play him. Now, maybe he was awful in training. Maybe. But Alex Kral is a good player. And the way he was treated at West Ham was fairly appalling, to be honest. But he's not the only one, because look at how they've treated Vlasic, who's a really good player. 
and he barely got opportunities, and now he's horsed out on loan. I was I was a little concerned that the similar thing was going to be happening to Lucas Bagata because he didn't really get in the team at the start. It was only you know a little bit afterwards that he started to get a few more games as a ten. Then Maxwell Corner is another one who's come in has not really had a look in, and then he got injured. I think he's only made one start so far this season in the league. Um, Moyes has a, a difficult time turning over the team. That's clearly a thing at the moment. He found a formula which works at West Ham. He got them away from the bottom of the table, but then he found himself seemingly unable or maybe unwilling to alter that at all. Like even Mikel Antonio has not actually been any good for over 12 months now. No. And yet it's taken quite a lot for Skamaka just to get a few chances in the team. Last year, he didn't really get taken out at all unless he was injured. There are there are quite a few issues at West Ham, and I already know a few West Ham fans who have had enough. Like, regardless of what he did last year, like this this year has been so so poor. Like, no Premier League team has lost more games than West Ham. That's no. really really bad. They're only one point above the drop zone. Yeah, I don't think that they will go down, but they don't want to be anywhere near the bottom. Um, you know, five six, let's say. So there are big things to sort out there. I think that they will go for. I would say they need two. I definitely think one in the defensive line and one in the in central midfield because, again, he's not really swapped things around too much. I think just before the break, Flynn Downs just started to play a couple more times, didn't he? But yeah. whether that's something that he's going to do with more frequency, I mean, I think it's very, very telling that yet again, not for the first time, um, you look at the, the top sort of two or three players by minutes and it is those two central midfielders. And if that's the case year after year, you are going to have a problem. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you look at the business they did in the summer, Agard, Ariola, Downs, Skamaka, Corne, Tilo Carrer, Emerson Palmieri, Lucas Paqueta. They've got this young Brazilian centre-back, Luzao, lined up to come in in January. Don't know much about him, to be honest. Um, but I, I assume, you know, the plan is that he comes in and he's a solid backup to begin with and can maybe develop into a starter. But it's a lot of money spent and a lot of backing for David Moyes. And I would imagine that Daniel Kretinsky, the new part owner, is probably the one driving that spending with you know real ambition because Sullivan and Gold have always just been about staying in the Premier League. And he might well say, well, look, we're, we're in the wrong place. We shouldn't be 16th. We, we, last season, we, we finished in the European spots the season before we finished in the European spots, then we spent all this money and now we're 16th, but yet he's still playing the players that were there when we were 18th a couple of years ago or 17th, whatever it was, when he took over. Maybe he needs to go. So yeah, if I was Moyes, I probably wouldn't be getting too comfortable in my seat. Um, I agree with what you said about about Mikel Antonio. Like he, He hasn't been good in quite a while. He, the idea of Mikel Antonio is better than the actual practice of Mikel Antonio in, in the current game. But yeah, and, and the thing is, they're going to need to replace Rice in the summer in all likelihood because he's he's been quite vocal about the fact that he wants to go and play for a Champions League team. So in all likelihood, he's gone in the summer. And you don't really want to be betting in two central midfielders at the same time. So if you get one in January, you can have them in place. And then in the summer, you sell rice and you go and get him. In last summer, they tried to buy Amadou Onana, Onana. He chose Everton for God knows what reason, probably money. And then they just ignored the fact that they've been trying to buy a player in that role, which it just didn't make any sense to me. Um, what's your second one then? Well, the Hampton Wanderers. Oh, yes. Yeah. New. So Matthias Cunha is coming in by the looks of it. What's your thoughts on him and what else do they need to do? Love Cunha. Um, don't think Atletico was ever a good move for him, to be honest. Uh, not the style of play that he really needs or where he could be made the most of. I'm surprised he went there at all. There were plenty of other teams interested at the time, obviously, but hasn't worked out for him and lost his place in the Brazil squad. I think it was the one he definitely needs to move. Um, really good signing for Wolves, to be honest. And I think I can only assume that people have not bothered to inquire because, you know, as a particular person or a couple of people who pull strings at who goes to Wolves and then nobody else gets a say in the matter so there's no point even inquiring either that or they've just forgotten that he was really good in the Bundesliga because mm. it doesn't seem to have been any noise about him going anywhere else and then suddenly he's just going to Wolves um, they need a forward 
I think that's fair to say. So that's a, a good start. I think they probably need, <clears throat> I'm not going to say one more, but a different type of forward. It depends on how Lopetegui wants to play it, obviously, but quite often we've seen him go with, uh, let's say, a more direct route of play. And Cunha is not going to be the one for that. So whether you just throw on Costa then for the last you know, 20 minutes of games or whatever, or whether you think you can get a bit more out of Huang Hee Chan playing that way, maybe. I think there's plenty of options for Wolves in terms of the build-up play. Mm. I'm very keen to see how they actually line up because obviously they've they've been like two months since they appointed him nearly and no Premier League games. So I didn't obviously watch the um, League Cup match. That was his first official game because why would you watch Wolves versus Gillingham after the World Cup final? But uh, I believe it was basically a fairly standard 4-3-3. Yeah. Runners from fullback, one sitting in midfield, one pushing on. Inside forwards, pretty standard stuff. Yeah, I mean, when when he gets Neto back, I'm quite excited to see what a Neto Cunha Guedes front three looks like. Because if the if Neto plays on the right and Guedes plays on the left, and they're tasked with being the main goal scorers, and Cunha is allowed to explore his whole box of tricks and play as a sort of false nine, I think that's going to be quite fun. When Sasa Kalasic comes back, I wonder if we'll see a 4-4-2 with Cunha off Kalasic and Guedes and, and Neto played wide. I think I think they could do with one more in midfield. Now, it may be that they have that player in Bubakar Traore, the young player they brought in from Mets in the summer. He does look very promising and he does look like that kind of dynamic, powerful player. And I think if you put him and Nunes, either side of Neves, that could be a really strong midfield. Um, and that would allow Joe Matinho to be more of a squad player and just, you know, use him as and when. So that might solve the midfield problem. But yeah, getting getting Cunha should solve some of the issues. Um, he's not a big-time goal scorer, but he does know how to score goals. And maybe his ability to bring others into the game we'll see others take a leap in terms of the amount of goals that they can get. I think Wolves will be fine. I know they are bottom of the league, but there's a lot of talent there and they've players to come back, including Neto. And I think we'll see Lopetegui get a lot more out of the likes of Matthias Nunes, who started really well and then lost his way when they started using him as a number 10. They could probably look to bring in maybe a different option at right back. Nelson Semedo's a bit average and Johnny Castro hasn't looked very good since coming back from those serious knee issues. I like the left back options in Ain't Nuri and Bueno. I like the two centre backs in Kilman and Collins. Jose Sa is Jose Sa. He's returned to earth with a crash this season after a great year last year, but I don't think he changed goalkeeper in a January window. So if I was looking to do something, I'd probably just look to bring in another body in midfield. And, you know, I suppose that does depend on... Maybe they're a team that needs to go and look to loan in a forward if Kalasic isn't going to come back this season. Yes, um, I think Kalasic would be a really good ideal, actually, um, front man. And then you try and play Cunha off one side, maybe, and then one of the many, many wide forwards they've got on the other. But it wouldn't surprise me if eventually he goes to a bit more of a 4-2-3 one as well. Um, he was a bit switchy between the two with... Uh, Sevilla, but also he had a much more powerful base of midfield at Sevilla. So this Wolves midfield is obviously decent. Neres obviously being a big part of that, but it's a lot more on the ball, let's say, rather than massive and monstrous and mm. you know you shall not pass kind of approach. So there's there's plenty here for him to work with. I'm not sure. I think it's going to be quite as easy as you seem to for them to escape that bottom three, to be honest. But He's good enough as a coach, I think, to coach them into a shape which doesn't lose so many games. That said, he has just left a club, which he coached into the bottom three by the time he left them. So whether it's just, you know, perfect storm leaving Sevilla at that time, whether it is, uh, you know, something he tried to do, which just didn't work out. And maybe he now goes back to what he was doing at the start of things. But there's there's definitely quite a lot of work on here for him. But it's a good base to build from, let's say, and it's not an insurmountable task to get four points back on West Ham and Everton, let's say. 
I, I just kind of feel like there are three worse teams in the league than them. Um, like Bournemouth, say, currently sit 14th. I, I would be willing to bet significant money they end up in the bottom three. I think Southampton, given how young their team is, there's loads of talent, but they're really, really young. I think they could find themselves in the relegation zone. And Everton have one of the worst managers to ever grace the Premier League in Frank Lampard. And they can convince themselves all they want that he gets them and all this other nonsense, but he's not a good manager. And they are where they are because they deserve to be there. And in truth, they probably should be in the bottom three right now. Forrest are definitely a candidate to go down. I think Leeds are a candidate to go down. I could still see Fulham potentially having a second half collapse and ending up in the bottom three. So I just think, I think Wolves will stay up, but it is going to be tough. Like there's no, there's no question that it'll be tough. They've got to start winning games. First things first, he has to make them harder to beat and he has to stop them conceding so many goals. Cause when you've only scored eight goals in 15 games, you can't be conceding 24 in those 15 games. You've got to have that number well down. I think that's the first thing he'll look to do. Um, my next team is Leicester City. James Justin is out with a torn Achilles. Ricardo Pereira is out with a torn Achilles. Their current right back is now Timothy Castanier, who's, well, average. He's also a better left back than he is a right back, and he's a better wing back than he is a full back. So I think they could do it looking at full back help. But I think the main position they need to address is centre back. Uh, Wout Faze looks a good player. But Kagla Sianchu has fallen off the biggest cliff imaginable. And I think he has to be sold in January because they had a contract in the summer. You've got to find a new home for him. And Johnny Evans can't stay fit because he's 34 and his body's just broken down. And Daniel Amarty, God bless him, the guy isn't a, isn't a centre-back. He's not a right-back either. He's He's the right side of a back three and probably not at the Premier League level. So I think they've just got to go and try and get a centre-back in who can play next to Wood Faze and just stop the rot because Danny Ward's not very good. Castanier's not very good. I like the midfield and forward options. I think there's loads of talent there in Madison and Thielemans and Ndidi and Barnes and Vardy and Daka and Iheanacho and even Aosie Perez can have a good game every so often. And Dewsbury Hall is an outstanding footballer. So I think if they could get a centre-back in, and stop themselves being so easy to get at. I think that would be a, you know, a big, big plus for them. And if you can put, you know, say a 22, 23 year old next to phase, who's I think 23, 24, that's something you can build with long term moving forward. I think that's got to be the focus for January for them. Yeah. I think when it comes to Leicester and centre backs, a big question is uh, who picks them, who gets the final say on who it is. I mean, there's been what, two or three now come in who have ultimately not really made themselves first choice and not really actually been that good or what they wanted them to be. And it's not a coincidence. Um, there, there has to be a better method of identifying and basically how do you start getting Fofanas again and stop getting Vestergaards. Um there's plenty here for Leicester. I don't think that Leicester are that bad aside. Their start to the season was abysmal, way, way, way worse than it should have been. Uh, but still nowhere near a bottom three or four or probably even seven club, to be perfectly honest. If they mm. finish mid-table, that would probably be par, given no investment and obviously sell them one or two off. But I think they've, they've got enough good individuals there that they would win games against the bottom clubs, even if it is just like a a Madison and one of the forwards sort of do bits. But my bigger concern there is over the number of players they've brought in who have not made themselves first team players. Like Sumari is a, another good example was basically looked for a while as though he wasn't even going to get a squad number at the start of the uh, summer until they got a couple of injuries. So there's, there's more there than just bringing in players. It's, it's got to be about having a, a group culture and a good identification of who will work well within that. There's quite a few players there who still need to be uh, replaced, let's say, on a longer term basis. I think there's a couple of players there who they really, the players themselves need to decide, what am I going to be now? Because like you look at someone like Kalechi Inacho, for example, he had such a good run, 
that he made the team play a front two so that he could be in the team. But then as soon as he like goes either injured or the end of the season or there's a, a break of some sort, he's back to square one. He's just back to, you know, a few minutes a game sub sort of player. And there's a few like that in the squad now. They have finally moved past Jamie Vardy, but not to any other player. It's just a succession of mm. rotations of who starts, of how they combine and all that kind of thing. So I think there's still quite a bit there to sort out, but they should certainly be active in January. I think the biggest thing they need to do is change the manager because I think he's had his time there. I think the start of the season was appalling and it was unacceptable considering the talent that's at the club. But you're right when you say a lot of players have arrived at the club and not established themselves, not developed. Sumari is one, Pats and Dak is another. I mean, those two were two of the most sought-after young players in Europe and Leicester got both of them. And Rodgers has done nothing with them. Neither of them is a better player now than they were when they arrived. No. And he presents himself as this great developer of young talent. The only reason I think he still has a job is because they couldn't afford to pay his buyout and he wouldn't he wouldn't accept anything less. Hello, I'm here to annoy you. I'm here to annoy you into listening to more of me and more of others on EPL Index. We don't just have the Anfield Index stuff. We've got EPL Index as well, which covers the entirety of the Premier League. And we have three podcasts and a whole bunch of really good writing on EPLindex.com. The podcasts are my own two-footed podcast, which is every day at 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, covering the whole league. We have a Tad Predictable hosted by Tadiwa. You know Tadiwa. He does Anfield Index. He presents a Tad Predictable before every Premier League match week. And then Kevin DeVries and his crew on the EPL roundtable there every week after the Premier League match week. So make sure you listen to everything we're doing on EPL Index and follow us there on Twitter at EPL Index. Thank you. Bye-bye. It is tough. Like The other thing they've got going against them is as well, Tielemans is at a contract in the summer coming. Madison and Ndidi are out of, the co- out of contract the following summer. So you might be looking at a situation where you lose all three of them in the next six months for, in Thielemann's case, nothing, and for Madison, lower than what you should get from. And indeed, given the short contract and the injury problems, he might go for far less than he, he would have gone for maybe a year or so ago. One of the problems they had was they held on to players a little bit too long. They forgot where they actually sit in the Premier League food chain which is they're a club that should buy players, develop them and sell them at their peak value. They got carried away because they had some success. And long term, it's going to hurt them financially because Madison should have been gone, not last summer, the summer before, for probably 60 odd million because there was interest from United and Spurs. Indeed, United had 60 million turned down for him two years ago. Telemans, they've turned down offers of 40 and 50 million. And now they're going to lose hugely on those players. Now, every so often they'll make up for it by over overselling uh, a Harry Maguire for 80 million when he's really worth about 35 to 40 or Wesley Fafana for 70 when he's really worth about 50. But it's a little bit unsustainable the way they've started to run themselves over the last couple of years. And there, there might be a a big painful period coming for them where they do have to tear it down and start to rebuild and rebuild without Madison, without Thielemans, maybe without uh, Harvey Barnes who might decide he wants to move on. I'd imagine there'll be clubs clubs that'll start sniffing around uh, Dewsbury Hall. Like Dewsbury Hall would be a really nice fit in the city midfield if Ilke Gundigan decides to move on. You could see him fitting into that role quite well. So, yeah, I, I think Leicester need to be active. But for me, like, you've got to address that defence. Jesus wept, it's awful. And it, ideally, somebody who's good in the air because you are appalling defending set pieces. Um, me specifically. Say again? Me specifically. <laughs> you, you, just you. Um, who's next for you? Next for me is Arsenal. 
Um, fairly obvious and standard, given that they are top of the league, but it is such a massive, massive opportunity for them, obviously, to stay in a title race. And I'm going to qualify that last bit of sentence by telling Arsenal supporters, at this stage, you're not in one. Um, I'm getting a bit fed up already of Arsenal fans saying, oh, we've managed it for half a season. No, we haven't. You've played 14 games so far. That's less than 40% of one season. To be in a title race in this Premier League, you have to be unbelievably consistent. And yes, you have done so far. And that has been very, very good on your part. But 14 games isn't a season or even half a season. And you are nowhere near being in the title race as yet. City can do this three more times in a row. You have just done it for the first time. Um, There's a long way to go in this. Personally, I'm still, uh, I wouldn't say unconvinced, but I am yet to be... Fully convinced, I suppose, is the way is the the right way to say that they can actually do this again and again and again and again and again. I think that there will be a couple of slip ups. I think that the overall depth of the team has not yet fully been tested. I think if they suddenly have to be without, let's say, that central midfield partnership that they've been um, playing so relentlessly, you might suddenly see a drop off there. In attack, they've got themselves really good depth. I think that's absolutely great. And it looks like they're going to add um, Madrid from Shakhtar as well. So they should be absolutely fine there. But I do have concerns over, let's say, fullback and centre mid in terms of consistency and drop off in quality or performance level if one is missing for a considerable period of time. Well, see, I, I actually think Tommy Asu is a better player than Ben White. So a right back, I'd be okay. Again, I, I think Kieran Tierney's a better player than Zinchenko. I do wonder what happens if Gabriel gets hurt. I, do they just move Ben White into central defence? I don't fancy a, a Saliba-Ben White centre-back pairing myself. I agree with you in midfield. Can, can we also rely on Granit Xhaka to maintain this level that he's never, ever, ever in his career displayed? Like, forget injury. He is going to come back down to his normal level. This is just a run of form. You know that saying, form is temporary, class is permanent? This is this is form. This is not class. Granicek's class is significantly lower than what we've seen in the first half of this season. I don't understand the Mudrik signing at all. Not even a little bit. I think it's one of the more flagrant wastes of money. He's a really good player, don't get me wrong. But in that left-sided role... You've already got Gabriel Martinelli and you've got Emile Smith-Rowe. I don't really think you needed to focus large resources in another right-footed left winger. Whereas on the other side, you've got Bakayo Saka and nothing. Like, I've seen Arsenal fans say, oh, well, Fabio Vieira can play that role. Okay, let's see him play there for eight games in a row if Saka gets hurt. And let's see you cry for Saka to come back. The other big worry is up front because Gabriel Jesus has been outstanding this season and now he's injured and there's no timetable on his return. And I do think Arsenal might be keeping a little bit of a secret there that maybe that injury is worse than people think it is. Can you rely on Eddie and Ketia? He's a good player, but he's never proven he can be a starting nine for a team that has even top four ambitions. I'm glad you said that they're not in the title race because they're not. The title race hasn't really begun yet. And as you said, City have proven year on year on year that they can do this all year long. You've proven you can do it for 14 games. And if we're being really honest, you've had an awful lot of luck in that 14 games as well. An awful lot of luck. You've got teams at exactly the right time to get them. The only impressive wins by Arsenal this season are Spurs and maybe away to Chelsea. But even at that, Chelsea were a disaster before the break. I'm not overly moved by them. And I think in the second half of the season, when teams have had more time to study them, more tape on them, more data on them, you'll see teams make adjustments. But you think that when we played them, they beat us 3-2. And the referee was the deciding factor in that game. He had three big calls to make, and he got all of them wrong. And if he gets them right, we beat them 3-1. And we didn't play well. We were awful on the day. But we should have beaten them 3-1. United schooled them. 
at Old Trafford. Arsenal fans t- came away thinking they'd been the better team, which just shows the delusion here. United schooled them. They sat back, they invited them on, they let them play their little patterns, and then they just tore them apart in the counterattack. And I think you'll see more teams look to invite them on. And without Jesus, is there a real cutting edge in, in that central area? And then just hit them on the counter and expose the fact that while William Saliba is very talented when the game's in front of him, when the game is behind him and he's turning and chasing, he really does not look like an elite level defender. Gabriel is error prone. Zinchenko at left back is a weakness defensively. Ben White isn't a great defensive player. And like I said, I, I don't think Xhaka can maintain this. I think they need to look for at least one in midfield. And I wouldn't be spending my attacking budget on Mudrik. I'd be looking to bring in either cover for Saka or somebody who can be a short-term fix up front while Gabriel Jesus is out. Yeah, I wonder what they're going to do about Jesus. I mean, obviously, Nketi's going to start now. But what happens I'm, if he gets hurt? Who's, who's, who's next? I'm not so much worried about who's next after him, but rather what can he provide now that he is going to be called upon game after game? Because, you know, let's face it, he hasn't had a run in the Premier League. We don't know no. what level he is going to be able to produce game after game after game after game. And again, this goes back to the relentlessness that you need. You can't just have, you know, an okay performance and you you drop points in two successive games and think that that's okay if you genuinely think that you're in tight ways. You get like seven games or so a season where you can drop points. Otherwise, you're not in the title race in the Premier League at this point in time. So you don't really have any um, any room for manoeuvre, let's say, if you're, if you're missing forwards and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, I wonder if maybe Martinelli gets the run of, as a nine, maybe late on in games, that kind of thing. There'd be, you know, someone gets a chance. Maybe it's Fabio Vieira finally gets some sort of minutes playing as a very, very, very false nine. They have got some options to change things around there because there's, like I said, good depth, reasonable level, or sort of more or less the same. And the off the ball movement has been really good for Arsenal. You have to say that, like as oh, it has, yeah. No, the, the um, rotations have been great. Yeah, very, very good. But so there's, he's, there's all of that has been Gabriel Jesus, and if he's mm-hmm. not there, Eddie and Katia doesn't. Eddie and Katia, I think, will score goals at the Premier League level. Like I think if you put him in Brighton's team and just said, just get yourself in the box and we'll get you the ball. Great. But he, what Jesus offers Arsenal, only about 15% of it happens in the penalty area. All the rest happens outside with his build-up and his movement and his dribbling ability. I, I just don't see how they replace that. So they're, they're going to have to alter how they're been, they've been playing. Yeah, maybe so a little bit. At least functionality-wise, I'd say, in the final third. But the build-up has been pretty good. So you would think that maybe even... Just getting Ketu a few early chances, try and get the confidence level up so he is producing as much as he can. And you think that he's obviously going to be putting in the effort because this is a big opportunity for him. Um, but if they add one or two, maybe they can then, like I say, sustain that that uh, pressure at the top. Personally, I think there's about maybe eight games or so, and we're going to see at that point then uh, uh, Arsenal actually going to be able to maintain this across uh, a longer spell because... You know, West Ham aside for the for the first game, Brighton away is a difficult one. Newcastle is very difficult. Then the Derby, then Man United. Everton could go either way, but away from home has generally been a fairly tough uh, trip for Arsenal. So then it's Man City only a couple of weeks later. So by by sort of mid February, yeah, personally I'm backing Man City to be first in the table, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I think I think City will win the league by by ten points. To be yeah. honest. I, I'm not ruling out the, the possibility of us finishing above Arsenal. I don't think we'll win the league. I think that's gone. But I, I do think we could finish above them because they, they've had a great run of form. We've seen teams have great runs of form. We saw those Leicester teams for those two years have unbelievable runs of form and finish fifth. Now, I think they will get top four. Yeah. But I don't know that they're first or second and maybe not even third. So we'll see. We'll see. They've had a great start. Fair play. Congratulations. It's 14 games. You've been bang average for years. So, you know, enjoy it. Um, they were on my list as well. So my, my four were actually Liverpool, West Ham, Leicester and Arsenal. So I'll just pick one more. Um, I think Tottenham need to make a move. 
I think Tottenham need to make a move at centre back. I know Eric Dyer had a decent run last season. I think he's been quite poor this season. I think the left centre back side has been a bit of an issue. Ben Davies is decent, but he's not he's not a top four starter. I think they've got Romero, who's brilliant, but he is prone to the odd injury. I think Tottenham need to be going out in January and looking to bring in a centre-back, either in the central role or the left-sided role. The left-sided role might be a bit easier to address. Now, I know they want Guardiol and Bastoni. I don't think either of them are realistic. Um, Bastoni, I think, is probably going to be at Inter for many years to come, unless they have huge financial issues. I think him and Barella are probably untouchable. I think Gvardiol, we had reports from Florian Pletiberg, is that his name? The man Pletigol on Twitter, uh, that Gvardiol has a buyout clause for next summer, which is a world record fee for a defender, which likely means Leipzig are not open for business this coming summer, unless somebody hits a similar price to that buyout, which is too rich for Spurs' blood. I think someone like Piero Hincapié of Bayer Leverkusen is ideal for the left side of a back three. I think he's good on the ball. He's strong defensively. He's aggressive. He's decent in the air. I think someone like him in that left-sided role with Romero in the right-sided role, I think you can patchwork the central position together until the summer when you go and you address that area. If I was Spurs, that's what I'd be looking to do. I think they're strong in central midfield. The wingbacks, they're not ideal, but there's enough players there to get you by. The other thing that they could look to maybe do is bring in somebody that could be a backup to um, Kulisevsky, who seems to have quite a few injuries. And when he's not there, they look a little bit lost because there's nobody to link midfield and attack. Now, maybe Brian Hill could be that backup, but Conte doesn't seem to know he exists. For me, I, I'd be saying to Spurs, go and get yourself at least one starting caliber centre back. Because for an Antonio Con- Conte team to have conceded 21 goals in 15 games is unacceptable. Like Conte wants to have one of the best defensive records in the league, or else his style of football can't really be all that effective in terms of, you know, winning a, a title. So I think they've got to address that back line. Yeah, I think that would um, be the first thing I would look for as well for, for Spurs. I think the wingbacks are not that good, but when have we ever known Conte to need great wingbacks? This man not won really... the title with Victor Moses and Marcus yeah. Alonso. Exactly. It's not something that he thinks is you know the, the area of the team which needs to be elite. It's the spine. The others have got to have very, very clearly defined tactical roles. They've got to have really good physicality all the things which support the team, but they are support acts. You know, mm. they, they help make the team work, but in a supporting way. Uh, it is that spine where you generally wants the best of the best of the best, and they definitely need one central player. I, you, I think they need the left centre-back personally. Yeah, uh, that's that's what I would go and do this this January. I would look to bring in somebody for that role. I think Hincapié could be a great fit. I think age profile-wise as well, he fits the timeline of the likes of Kulisevsky, of Romero, of Destiny, Destiny Odoiji, who will be arriving in the summer from Udinese, who looks a really special talent. And if they have him and Sessegnon as the left wing-back options for the long term, that's potentially going to be great for them. They've obviously got Perisic could play there now for the short term. Right wing-back, I mean, I, I really like Jed Spence, but Conte seemingly doesn't. Um, Emerson Royale, he's there, and Doherty is is limited, but can be effective if used properly. I think you if you if you solidify that defense, you've got enough going forward, and your central midfield options. I think Basuma needs more of a run. I'd like to see Basuma and Bentoncourt played together more. But Heusberg is a good player. Ollie Skip's a good player. They might have Harry Winks back in January because Sampdoria might be cancelling the loan because of the injury. He's a decent Premier League player. So, you know, you'd have a, gr- a core group. That, and you've got Pape Matar Sar, who's really, really talented. So, 
you know, looking at the long term midfield situation, I suppose I wouldn't I wouldn't be investing any more money there. I think you've got five or six that you can use in that role. Your left wing back situation I think is fine because Odoiji will arrive in the summer. Yeah, maybe you want to upgrade right wing back. Do that in the summer. Do that in the middle centre back position in the summer. And the goalkeeper is going to need to be upgraded. But for now, just go and get somebody like Incapié. Stop dreaming of Cavardiol. Stop dreaming of Bastoni. They're they're not going to happen for you. You, you just you don't have the financial resources to go and get those players. And if the manager can't accept that, that's on him. But Incapié is a really really good player. And if you build a good relationship with Leverkusen, maybe you can go back in the summer and get someone like Edmund Tapsoppa who can play that middle role to a high level. You know, maybe when Florian Wirtz comes up for sale in a year or two, maybe you can be in the mix for that. Maybe you've got an established relationship there and a deal can be easier. But uh, for now, just go and get a centre-back. Do you have any other Premier League teams? No, Tottenham were actually my last one. Perfect. Right. So let's move on then to one team from outside the Premier League. And once again, in the spirit of Christmas, I will grant you first go at this and you'll probably steal mine. So let's let's go with this. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home Internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want whenever I want and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48 hour no obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac, and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes, and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. But I don't think that I will have yours. Um, I'm going for a team we've already briefly touched on earlier on, the former club of Jules Lopetegui, and that is Sevilla over in La Liga. Uh, they've had a dismal, dismal start to the season, only 11 points taken from 14 games, which as all Arsenal fans know is not half a season. Uh, with Jorge Sampaoli now in through the door, they should be very, very watchable, and they're only a point from safety, so it shouldn't be any longer-term worries over you know salvaging the, the, the campaign and moving up the table. But they definitely need a few parts to make it work in terms of a San Paoli team. Um, contrary to what I just said about two seconds ago, which is now no longer part of this podcast, since I came to Spain and haven't really looked at any football news whatsoever, Isco has been bombed out of the club. Well done. Good first decision for him to be making is useless rubbish. No energy, no effort, basically everything that does not go into a San Paoli 11. So that's a good start. Uh, and thanks very much, Guy, for pointing out after I said that they should probably do something like that, that uh, told me they already have. Yeah, um, getting rid of Isco is, is a good start. I, I do like the line that he didn't meet club expectations. <laughs> I don't know if they watched Isco for the last few years when they set their expectations for him. I, I don't know what it was that they expected. Like, we've seen what Isco is now. Um well, yeah, it's the, it's the right decision to move on from him without question. They they have a lot of talent in the squad. I don't know that they've done all that well in the transfer market in the last couple of years. It feels a little bit like Monchi's lost his mojo a little bit. Now, maybe the financial restrictions of the club have, have worn down the genius. But, like, I, I looked at... I did this a couple of weeks ago. I was talking to somebody and they were... It, it was around the time that Lopetegui was being linked with the Wolves job the first time before he turned it down. And they were saying, oh, well, you know, he's 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 been given plenty of backing at Sevilla. And I was looking at the players they brought in and like Jesus Corona is OK and Thomas Delaney is OK and Rafa Mir is, is OK. 
but you know, Monty Monty I do like uh, Augustinson. I, I I think is decent. He's obviously gone on loan though because it didn't work there. In the summer, just gone. I mean, Marcao, he's a solid centre back. Uh, uh, Nianzu, I think, has huge potential for the future. But Adnan Yanazai and Isco and Casper Dahlberg on loan and Alex Tellers on loan, like these, these aren't the moves of a team with real serious Champions League ambitions. Not when you're selling Jules Kunde and Diego Carlos, your two starting centre backs. Like the, these aren't the moves that you make. You, you loan out Lucas Ocampos because he's had a fallout with the manager, and I just, it's all very meh. There's talent there, but there's a lot of meh. Like, I like the keeper. Kareem Rakik was good about seven years ago at PSV. He's been garbage since. Suso, he spent a load of money on him, and he's he's just he's just not for me. Uh, Jean Jordan, I do like. I think he's a good midfielder. Rakitic is well past his best. Uh, Bono, I think, has become one of the more overrated goalkeepers in Europe. Um, but, you know, I, I do like him. Um, Nianzu, like I said, he's got huge potential, but you can't be bringing him in and expecting him with very little first team experience to replace Kunde or Carlos. It's just not going to work. So overall, like there's players there that never reached the potential, like Oli Torres. It's just it's a bit of a a strange squad, talented but strange. And like you said, I think I think more dynamism is is absolutely needed. I I just don't know where they go or, or what kind of money are they going to have to spend. Well, I think that's the thing. Usually, let's say pre- first Monchi era. It wasn't about spending money. It was about identifying players who you could sell for money later on, who were obviously going to be growing and be good. And in like two, three years, you could sell them on for a really, really good markup. And that's something that hasn't really happened since, well, I was going to say since he came back from Roma, but actually since he left and went to Roma as well is probably the right answer um, because his, his his dealings there were not stellar, let's say, over the longer term now, which it reasonably is in terms of buying and selling players. It hasn't proven to have been that good there either. Uh, so they, they haven't really got the biggest names where you can sell to raise funds, I don't think, anymore. They they really went into a big battle to try and sign Rafa Mir, which I thought was a bit odd at the time, but, you know, fine, whatever. But then didn't really make him a, an absolute guaranteed starting player anyway. And it was quite a lot of money, you know, respectively speaking. Some of the players that they have brought in, like you said, like Dallas is there now. They brought Rakitic back, obviously, Lamella coming in. Like They're fine. They're good enough players. We're not going to get any sell-off fee for them, even no. if they're not just the ones who are on loan anyway. So it is a bit of a, an in-between squad at the moment. Uh, I think it's it's fine because you've kind of then got a blank slate to rebuild what you want. But the problem is, obviously, the finances. You're not going to be in Europe next year. It's going to be a little bit hamstrung in terms of how much you can do wheeling and dealing. You might and you, need you don't have players to sell to, to yeah. refurnish the squad. Yeah, so you may just have to kind of sell quite a lot, work next season on a much, much smaller squad, use a few younger players if they have them available to come through, and maybe try and rebuild over a period of like 24 months, basically. Yeah, like it's for a Monchi squad, like a Monchi built squad, it, the age profile is just all over the place. Yeah. And like there's just, there's been even some of the sales they've had in recent years that, I suppose in hindsight, you can look and say, okay, well, maybe they did well. But like, say, for example, Brian Hill, who Spurs paid a substantial fee for 22 million with with add-ons. But in Monchi's first era at Sevilla, they would have kept him for another year or two, integrated him into the first team after the loan spell at Ibar and seen that value rise to 40 million. And then they would have sold him, and that would have led to maybe three new signings. Whereas when they sold him for the the 22 million, it was kind of one signing that they brought in, in in Rafa Mir mostly. That's where most of that money went. To bring him in, it just... uh, They they obviously got Lamella as well. Um, So it was Lamella, I think, like 10 or 12 million, and they put that money towards Rafa Mir. Like, it just... It seemed like a strange move, and, and, you know, you... Even bringing in Lamella, good player, but the wrong age for Sevilla. 
a little bit like Leicester, they seem to have forgotten what they are and what they should be and how they built that club over the last 15 years. Um, my European club is also from La Liga uh, and mine is Atletico Madrid. Now, we have a podcast, I think, already out where we rebuilt Atletico Madrid and I, I really do think they need to be active in January. I, I think... The goalkeeper is great, and he seems to have re- rediscovered, you know, most of his form. Jimenez is fantastic when he's fit, but he does have injury problems. Uh, Nahuel Molina is is an excellent right back, but Savage is, is average. Felipe is crap. Hermoso is is decent, but he's also injury prone. I'm not a fan of Mandava. I I, I don't really think Regulon has worked out there at all. Um, I, I, in fact, I, I don't. Has he even? I think he might have played once or twice. The midfield, can dog be as okay? I like De Paul. I like Koke, but he's past his best. I like Lamar, but he's never really done what Thomas Lamar can do since going there. Lorente for me is hugely overrated, and then after that one great season he had, he's come back down to earth. I love Saul, but he's not the same player anymore. He's been a bit more Saul esque this year. But Axel Witzel is years past his best. I don't like Carrasco. Joao Felix, one of the strangest signings in the history of football, giving him to Diego Simeone. Griezmann is is having a, a renaissance, so that's great. Cunha is on his way out. Correa is a good player, but I think he's probably a squad player. And you know my feelings on Alvaro Morata. Like, I think they need something in in every line. They need a centre-back. They need more dynamism in midfield. They've never really replaced the physicality they lost in Rodri and Thomas Partey. And they tried to do it with Kondogby and Witzel, but, I mean, you know, you're replacing Merckx with Ladders. And then they, they need something up front, something different up front, because... Jeez, Alvaro Morata, like, it's painful. It's painful watching that fella play. He's always offside. Always. Yeah, I mean, like, Atletico is such an odd squad. There's so much talent there to work with, but it's, you know, maybe the most in Europe, apart from Man City, team where you have to play the way that the team plays. Like, you have to have the players who can produce what the manager wants and what the manager wants isn't really always what those players are most capable of producing mm. like even like Antoine Griezmann I think is such an unbelievable footballer and he's really good for Atletico Madrid in that he has that combination of technical and tenacity but even then I don't think they get anywhere near as much out of him as they should do like no. maybe over the second half of the season they will do because there's uh, more games that he's going to be able to start and play now. The, the ownership thing is all sorted out. But even so, I don't think that they get anywhere near enough out of him. Like he could give another probably 20% on top at the minute compared to what he, he is doing or has been able to. And you go down the list of the other attackers in particular, but even some of the build up players, the midfielders, you want more from them. I'm always, always, always left wanting more from Atletico Madrid. And um, so whether it's just. Time is up, basically, and it's it's been too long now um, with Simeone there or whatever. I've, I've I wouldn't say I've lost interest in them, obviously, because they're still a massive part of La Liga. But I have definitely got massively lowered expectations of what mm. they are going to do at any point. I just don't Same. think that that is capable anymore. Same. I I do kind of feel like this should be the last season for Simeone. I, I feel like he needs to walk away take an extended break, at least a year, maybe even two years, and just completely, you know, refresh, re-energize, and then take on a new project, be it Inter Milan, be it Lazio, be it whoever. Like, clubs will queue up to get him. But I feel like he needs to take at least a year away. And it, it kind of, it feels like when he leaves, whoever takes over should almost just begin to sell everybody and just completely change the makeup of the squad and not have any holdovers bar maybe all black because he's a goalkeeper. He can adapt, but I think everybody else you, and, and maybe Molina because he hasn't been there that long. You just look and say, right, we're, we're just going to start over here. Cause like 
if you've got a team that has Rodrigo de Paul and Thomas Lamar, you should have plenty of creativity from midfield. If you've got Griezmann, Joe Felix, and they won't have him anymore, but Matthias Cunha, you should have loads of creativity and goals in the final third. And nothing has worked with, with those five since they've come, or in Griezmann's case, come back to the club. Because Simeone's system and structure and fundamental principles just haven't allowed those players to be themselves. Now, in Rodrigo de Paul's specific situation, that might have worked to his um, to his benefit because the Rodrigo de Paul they bought from Udinese doesn't turn in the performances that de Paul turned in in the World Cup. He turned in those performances because Diego Simeone has drilled those performances into him over the last couple of seasons. Um, but he, he he's capable of of a lot more. Um, yeah, like there, there's a good team there. It's just if the managers. I think I think I think Simeone's lost something about himself. Like maybe maybe he's just worn down. Maybe he's just exhausted to manage Atletico Madrid for as long as he has has got to be incredibly draining because that's a very chaotic club. Historically, it's always been mental there. And he is by far the longest serving manager in the history of the club and easily the greatest manager in the history of the club. But, you know, at certain points, it, it all becomes a bit too much. They never recovered from the summer of 2019. I know they won the league title after that. But when you look at the players that left... The, the experienced players like Juan Fran and Godin and uh, and uh, Felipe Luis, as well as those younger players that he had planned to build with, like Lucas Hernandez and Rodri, like that's that's just too much to lose in one summer. You're losing your your now and your future all in one go, and it they they haven't been the same level of team since, even with that league title when it, that was the the COVID title was all a bit spooky. And obviously Suarez was doing some some mad things. I, I, yeah, I think they just need to go and address something in, in January because they do run the risk of missing out on top four. And, and financially, I don't think they can afford to miss out on top four. Even if he moves on, you want to be presenting a new manager with a top four club and saying, look, we're, we're an appealing club to come to. We've got talent. We're in the Champions League. You're going to have to shake things up, but, you know, come to us. The other club... In Spain, I do think, and I just want to get your brief thoughts on this. I think Barcelona need to make maybe one small move in January to try and sustain what was a great start to the season. But like with Arsenal, you're not in a title race because it's 14 games. And you've got the exact same record as Arsenal, but significantly better defensively, by the way. The best defensive team in Europe, FC Barcelona. There's lots of talent there. But I, I, I feel like they need... One more in midfield because I kind of feel like Busquets is just going to stop moving one day and, and there's going to be nothing more. And it, as things are, he is already running on fumes. I mean, there's still talk that he could actually leave in January. Um, obviously, he's out of contract at the end of the season, but it may well be brought forward uh, for, for an MLS move at the start of their campaign as such, which is obviously part of uh, the retiring from Spain. Same sort of thing. Whether that's just talk, we'll obviously have to wait and see. I think they need a centre-back, personally. Um, they need a centre-back or to start establishing which central pairing they want to play on a longer-term basis. Mm. Uh, PK obviously, is another one now who has fled the scene as such. They ended up with uh, Alonso having to play centre-back for, for a little spell prior to the World Cup. So And nobody wants yeah. to see that. <laughs> no, nobody wants to see that. Not, not even... Uh, Alonso himself wants to see that, to be perfectly honest. So whether it is a case of Araujo now has had enough time to recuperate and they think that he can play more regularly, Christensen obviously was the same. He was injured a lot beforehand but played in the World Cup. So between those two and whether Koundé now goes back to centre-back, because I think everyone can probably say we want you at centre-back and not doing what you did at right-back in the World Cup of France. Mm. Um, that would be three, like obviously really strong, quite young players. Eric Gassi is still there, which is fine as a fourth. Should absolutely not be a starting centre-back for, for Barcelona. But as a fourth, that's fine. And he's obviously 
got like three years to get to a similar sort of level as as Kunde or whatever. Um, that would be okay. But at the moment, you are there talking about two who have been out injured, two who have had surgery, one who has been in and out through injury, uh, and a younger player who you want to be your fourth choice. So you might well need a fifth one there anyway. A, gr- a grown up. Yes. Yeah. A um, big, hairy, that- grocky, heady, shouty, not that good, but reliable sort of grown up. Not Phillips to Barcelona. <laughs> 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 Dan Kenneth, get the villa ready, son. Your young fella's going to Spain. Um, yeah, because they're very, very high on this young Moroccan centre back they've got as well, uh, Chadi Riyad. He's apparently very, very talented, and and they're quite excited by him. If Kunde moves into the middle, they need a right back as well, though. So mm. you, you've they, they definitely do need to address there because Hector Bellerin is just not an acceptable option in the in the year of our Lord twenty twenty three. Um. <laughs> I'd like to see a lot more of uh, Alejandro Balde at left back. I, I think he looks a real player as well. Like there's a there's loads of re- there's loads of reasons for this club to be excited now. Like it to their credit, they have turned things around very very quickly. The question is, have they absolutely screwed themselves financially moving forward? And the answer is probably. Um, but there's there's loads of talent here and. You know, we we talked about Kessie earlier on, and maybe they could sell him and use that money to bring in a defender. Um, and, and you know that that might be something they can do in the short term. Again, maybe they should be looking at the um, the out of contract twenty twenty three market. Like Stefan De Vries, would he fit that? Grown up in the room, big, grocky, heads the ball, kicks the ball, leads the defense. He's very slow. Is the issue? Yeah, he is. But I mean, like, they've been playing BK in some of the games, so they can't be too bothered about it. No, and Marcus Alonso is not exactly uh, a, a rapid mover either. Yeah. Um, I, I think they'd love to, to, you know, maybe get someone like an Evan and Dicker who can play multiple roles and has that kind of pace. But whether or not Eintracht will sell him in January, I don't know. He's been linked with Arsenal as well. Uh, I know they've been linked with Inigo Martinez. For me, I'd be I'd be avoiding that deal because he's 31. He's not exactly the biggest, and no. I, I just he wouldn't be for me. Um, De Vries is the name that kind of stands out in the in the market of players who are out of contract in the summer. Although one name, this is a completely out of the box one, but he's done really well in Syria. Ah, he's 33, and he's out of contract in the summer, but he's a kind of a key player for Roma. Is Chris Smalling. And he could be that type of, you know, head it, kick it, can play a high line. He's got the experience. He's not a great player by any stretch. No one will ever confuse Chris Smalling with a great player. But he might just fit the profile of someone to bring in, get 18 good months out of him. By the time he leaves, Arejo's grown up. Kunde's a bit more experienced. Maybe Eric Garcia has become a footballer. And maybe this uh, Chadi Riyad has has developed into a first team level player. I I look at Eric Garcia though, Carl, and I see a holding midfielder. I don't see a centre back when I watch him play. I think he's physically. I just don't think he's he's got the right attributes. So I wonder if maybe he could be an option in midfield in in one or two games. But like someone like a Chris Smalling might just fit the bill for them. Yeah, that wouldn't be the worst thing at all. Like I say, you don't want someone who's necessarily going to have to play. Every game, you need someone who's going to lead the team when it's, uh, you know, backs against the wall situations, maybe coming off the bench or filling in for maybe two games in a row and then not for five games. Someone who's just able to plug in, play, you know, maybe 15 to 25 times a season, depending on the other players' uh, fitness levels and that, and, and just be reliable and just do the job very reasonably well. They want basically a level or two up from when we had Kyriakos. That's yeah. it. Yeah, literally, somebody like that would do would do a job for them, and just all they 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 don't want to be spending big money on this player. It's just it's a small move yeah. to help them maintain uh, where they are, and you know the, the likelihood is they fall off and end up second. But you never know. You never know. Real are having a bit of a strange. I think they'll be all right to be honest. I think Real probably go 
let's say, more all-in to try and beat us in the Champions League, for example, and win that again. La Liga, they kind of just sort of take it or leave it. That's not their that's not their main thing, to be fair, for Real Madrid. So no, Barca, without obviously Champions League uh, concerns in the second half of the season, I'd be going all in for for league games and just playing whoever needs minutes in the in the other cup. But do make sure you knock Manchester United out of the Europa League. That is that is all. priority number one. Right. Well, we can leave that there. Um, anything that you want to mention before we go? No, have a happy Christmas, everybody. Hope there's uh, enough stuff lifts listening in your earballs over Christmas, and uh, we'll be back after that with all the games coming. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a busy schedule. Um, loads of games, and we'll have scouted for for all the games, and except the FA Cup, we don't we don't do the FA Cup here. We're not acknowledging the FA Cup here, and we're hoping that Wolves beat us and send us home in that competition, so we can focus on winning the European Cup and doing well in the league. Uh, Thank you as always for listening and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.